All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the first episode of the Between Sundays podcast. Uh, we're going to have a great time here. We That's don't right. even know what we're doing, Chris Dolberry, That's but right. we're here. And I am here with the one and only renowned speaker, author, <laughs> theologian, the great Chris Dolberry. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Glad you're joining us today. Pastor Sam, good to see you. Good to see you. Listen, Chris is the brains behind this podcast. He's the one that actually has content. Uh, I'm just here for the commentary, <laughs> and uh, but hey, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a blast doing this over the next four weeks. And um, if you uh, uh, missed this past Sunday, here's the heart behind this: that we only have about 35 minutes on a Sunday to dive into some of these tough issues, and we just wanted to spend a little bit more time uh, talking about these. And yeah. so over the next four weeks, uh, we're gonna be diving in just a little bit further into these contents. We'll be having a good time. We'll be laughing. That's right. Uh, but we'll also be talking about some some serious issues. So um, I'm going to let Chris facilitate, take it away, take facilitate. us wherever you want. Oh, that's dangerous. You're the point guard. That's man. That's dangerous. <laughs> that's a dangerous. Move. Hey, I, let's talk for just a second about okay. just just the the philosophy or the strategy just behind this series, man. What was God stirring in your heart? Even thinking about asking the question, what would Jesus do about cultural yeah. topics? Well. WWJD, <laughs> you you remember? Was it the nineties? Oh that yeah, baby. Out? Listen, if you're a kid of the nineties, you had a WWJD bracelet. You had you, the bracelets, WWJD. They were everywhere. But the but the question, you know, is such a great question of what would Jesus do? And and it was just trying to think through as we come off of Easter. When you look around at the world today, I, I think Christianity, I think Jesus, I think it's all getting really confusing because you have a lot of people claiming Jesus would say this or Jesus would do this or it's okay to do this and be a Christian. Yeah. Um, and the reality is um, a lot of it is false. Yeah. And so it was trying to go, how do we take uh, what we're seeing in culture and then say, what would the person, what would the life, what would the teachings of Jesus actually say about these issues? Because the great thing about the Bible that I believe and you believe, that's why we're here, is that even though it was written thousands of years ago, it's still just as as applicable today as it was back then. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I, you know, uh, there we've never lived in a day I think that's so confusing, and where there are so many streams of uh, news and broadcasts and information coming at people in all kinds of different directions and from different perspectives. So to speak on this, you know, from what Jesus says and what the Bible says, I think is super important in the day we live. You know, it, it was the other day, like you, you had an instant where. I read where the White House put out that the president, and this isn't to get political one way or the other, it's just the world we live in. Um, he was saying, hey, today, uh, my wife and I are celebrating Easter like um, tons of other Christians. But on the same day he signed in, it's uh, Transgender Visibility Day. Yeah. When you live in a world like that, it gets really confusing on what does Jesus approve, what does he disapprove of, yeah. and what is Christianity. And I think that's why this is so important, even if it's things that maybe we don't want to talk about. Yeah. Maybe we don't want to bring up. And the truth is a lot of it is uncomfortable to talk about in church, but it's comfortable to talk about outside of church. Yeah. And the problem with that is that means it's being talked about when we leave this place Yeah. between Sundays, right? It's yeah. being talked about. And then everyone's being discipled. Yeah. It's just, what are they being discipled by and who are they being That's discipled right. by? And are we being discipled by the media, what we listen to, other people in our community, or are we being discipled by uh, Jesus and his word? And I think that's why it's so crucial for the church to dive into some of these tough issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, you know, when I prepare sermons, and I'm, I know when you do too, there's always that, you know, you, you, you prepare a lot of content and then you have to cut. And there's always that one thing that you had to cut but we, you, because of time and you wish you didn't have to cut it. What's that thing that maybe you wanted to say on Sunday or, or didn't have time to say that you cut? You know, Sunday, like these messages for me are a little bit different. And I, I think for me, Sunday was more of really trying to navigate how do I how do I say something where I can keep people listening and people not tuning out automatically because they already have some kind of idea or yeah. political idea. Yeah. And and even for me going, okay, I'm not gonna get emotional in this. I'm gonna come at it from a place of love to try to love people to where they need to be through the preaching of the word. And I think for me, it was more like a few times when I ran through my message, uh, there was maybe this uh, this uh, righteous anger that, that mm -hmm. came out, which then I had to go, that's not gonna get anybody anywhere. Yeah. Like, 
I, I've got to love people through this, explain this, articulate it. Um, but there wasn't as many things for me. It was more of like, how do I navigate it? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, <laughs> it's not comfortable. Right. Yeah. And, and then how do we talk about it in a large room? And I think that was the harder thing for me is like, how do we do this in a way where emotions don't get at play? Yeah. And we can just have a conversation. Yeah. I, I thought it was a great message and I thought it was an important one. And, and uh, one of the things that stood out to me was um, if you didn't see the sermon uh, on Sunday, you need to go to YouTube and watch it. But there was this moment where uh, you threw up some pictures of um, Big E, Everett, <laughs> Big e. Uh, and, uh, and Banner, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you were talking about how they love each other and don't see color. Uh, talk about uh, what that means. What, what does it mean as a church body? To, to be a people, because we, we tangibly, practically, we, we do see color. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean to live as though we don't? Yeah, I, I think that my heart would be, when we talk about that subject, yeah. is that in a room um, like our room that we're sitting in right now at our yeah. church, yeah. Um, with all the different people who come in and out, that we would know people who don't look like us yeah. and even um, uh, begin to hurt when they hurt, yeah. feel what they feel. The Bible calls us to that, right? And go yeah. to a deeper level. Yeah. And, I, and I think even in church, we can, um, you know, you see it on Sundays. Uh, nothing wrong with it. I do the same thing a lot of times, but we go to the same section. Yeah. We sit in the same place with the same people. And did we ever even at our church begin to talk someone to someone that doesn't look like us, doesn't sound like us, uh, is from, some, from somewhere different than us, because I, th I think that's when we begin to understand people differently. We begin to learn about them. And then that's when we're more compelled uh, to hear them yeah. and to let God work in us. Yeah, I, uh, I love that. I was chatting with a buddy on Sunday afternoon and we were talking a little bit about the sermon. And, and uh, he was telling me about a preacher that he'd heard one time referring to the church body as like a good stew where, where uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've got potatoes and you've got carrots and whatever else is in the stew, you know. And all, stew. All I haven't heard the, stew in a while. Stew, man. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like where there's uh, every flavor and every vegetable is distinct. Yes. Absolutely. But it all makes this this beautiful flavor. When it all comes together, it's even better than they were individually. Absolutely. You don't lose the flavor and the distinctiveness of each of the, you know, the, the vegetables. But when it all comes together, it's this incredible picture. And I just love that in the body of Christ, we can celebrate our distinctiveness and our differences. Uh, but when we come together, it's this beautiful picture of even what you described of heaven one day when, um, you know, every tribe, every tongue, every nation comes together and bows before the throne of Jesus. Absolutely. Chris, let me ask you this, too, as we as we talk about this, you know, like uh, you've been at different places. Um, you've you've, uh, you know, worked at different churches. You've been with different people. And uh, you and I talked about this a little bit uh, about just my conversation with some of the guys on our staff. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see uh, even and I'm throwing it back at you when it comes to that conversation with our staff? Um, and, and diversity, because if, if we don't do it as a staff, our church will never do it. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I want us to be a staff, uh, that, uh, empathizes when, like you said earlier, when one person hurts, another person hurts. And because of my perspective, e even with someone who has the same skin color as me, we still have different backgrounds. And because of my perspective, I have a different way of seeing the world and different way of seeing life. And so I think regardless of skin color, background, socioeconomic class, whatever it is, that there's this, this way we see people like, you know, Paul would say, um, I pray that the eyes of my heart uh, might be open, you know, and, and so I, I would hope that our, our staff would lead the way for our church body in our, uh, the eyes of our hearts being open and us being able to see people, um, as Jesus did, you know, the Bible says Jesus saw people, um, and he had compassion on them like sheep mm -hmm. without a shepherd, that we'd be able to have compassion and empathize with others hurts and, and hang ups yeah. and backgrounds and, and what the pain yeah. that they're going through. There was a, an old Jewish philosopher, not even a Christian, but I love this quote is his name's Philo, Philo of Alexandria. Mm. And he said, be kind because everyone you see is fighting a great battle. Yeah. And I would hope that our staff could lead the way in um, empathy and in recognizing that every single one of us is fighting some kind of battle. And so yeah. uh, if, if somehow we could slow our world and our pace down enough mm -hmm. um, 
to, to empathize with another, to mm-hmm. recognize the battle someone's fighting. And, and as the Bible says, to help spur all of us, each other mm-hmm. on toward maturity in Christ. To me, yeah. man, if our, if our staff could lead the way in that, yeah. man, what an incredible um, amount of, uh, I always say move the dial, you know, mm-hmm. what an incredible amount of the dial could be moved yeah. if we could do that. That's great. You know, yeah. I, I know that um, we're going to bring Derek on here in just a moment. Yeah. You guys will hear about him. He's a guest that's going to talk with us. But, um, man, I, I kind of have a dream that I haven't always uh, talked about. But as we're talking right now, I'm just thinking of that uh, I, I would love one day, even like when we look around at churches and we look at people raising people up and sending people out, I would love for us to be a place that raised up and sent out all kinds of different people. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is like we sent out Hispanic pastors, we sp- yeah, sent yeah. out uh, black pastors, we sent out whatever it is, fill in the blank. And not only, because I think what you see a lot of times, Southern Baptist Convention's great, tons of great churches, tons of great pastors. Yeah. Uh, I know there's controversy right now and different things, but there are tons of great people and churches in it. Um, but even there, how often do we see us sending out different pastors that don't look like us? Yeah. Um, and I thought, man, how cool would it be um, to be a, a place that sends out in that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got a guest coming on today, Derek Delane, and I'm gonna let Chris Dolberry introduce him to us because Chris knows him well, has known him for a long time. Well, we're excited to bring in Pastor Derek Delane, pastor of Proclamation Church in uh, Nashville. Man, an incredible brother, incredible pastor, killer preacher. And uh, even though he's a Duke Blue Devils fan, his shoe game is really strong. <laughs> we, we'll take it easy on him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Rocky top, baby. Derek and I were chatting last night for just a minute. We were recording this on Tuesday, and we were uh, we were chatting last night for a minute during the national championship game. Oh, yeah. And he was like, who are you a fan of? And yeah. I'm like, well, unfortunately, championship games, you know, don't mean a lot to me because I'm an Auburn guy. So we don't get too excited <laughs> about any kind of championships. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hey, Derek, man, tell us just a little bit about what the Lord's doing at Proclamation Church. Yeah, yeah. Well, first off, thanks for thanks for having me, guys. Glad I could be here to to have this conversation with you all. But man, the Lord has just been really kind to us. Um, we just celebrated three years uh, just this past Sunday, April seventh, and um, man, it's just so cool to see over the last three years how the Lord has been bringing uh, not just people to salvation, but seeing marriages restored, uh, lives being transformed, uh, the gospel going and actually taking root in the heart of uh, our people, and by proxy, hopefully, the heart of the city. Um, and it's just really dope to be a part of. It's awesome. Yeah, man. You know, one of the things I love about your preaching and your ministry there is like uh, you you want to preach the whole counsel of God and the gospel and the mm. centrality of the gospel so important to you. And you preach with a level yeah. of depth that is not super common in our day. We've been talking in this series that we started this week and even today as we record, you know, about um, what it looks like to be fearfully and won- wonderfully made and being made in the image of God, the Imago Dei and, mm-hmm. and, and what that really means. And so we're in, engaging in this conversation and sort of entering the fray in this conversation about racism. And um, and so when you think about the concept of being created in the image of God and uh, and how that's um, fractured by the enemy and, and then it makes his way out uh, in it kind of manifests its race. Racism. What, what does that as a mm-hmm. black man and maybe even take yeah. it a little further as a black pastor leading your church that's very multicultural? Mm-hmm. What is the term racism and the way that sort of a flavor of brokenness? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? Yeah, well, first off, I'll say as you guys are stepping into this conversation, man, I just want to pray that the Lord, you know, blesses it and honors it because this is a it's a really difficult thing. Um it's it's triggering for some people uh, to have a conversation like this. Uh, I think especially uh, even in our churches, unfortunately, when we bring up this conversation, uh, the idea behind it often is followed with, well, let's just focus on the gospel. Let's like it's about Jesus and who he is. And we're not supposed to talk about things like that. Right. Because this is uh, divisive. And for me, I would follow that up with was like, yes, this it's not the gospel, but this is an implication of the gospel. Right. We are first and foremost vertically reconciled between us and God because of everything that Jesus has done, which now gives us an opportunity to horizontally be reconciled to each other. Um, and so we, this is an implication of the gospel. It is not the gospel. It's an implication of the gospel. And so I think oftentimes when we have the conversation of, of race and racism, like I said, it can be very triggering. And so 
Um, man, as a black man, my my perspective uh, has shifted, not just in the conversation of like race and racism, but but um, biases that have taken place. And this is what I mean by that. Um, I think oftentimes what you guys may come across in your church and what we just come across in churches all, all across America is this idea that, hey, I'm not racist. Like you're bringing up this conversation and I'm not racist. This isn't something that I struggle with or other people that I know and love that they struggle with. So why are we talking about it? Um, but to me, I feel like it's less than just um, skin color and more about perceived or unperceived bias. Um, for example, right? Um, oftentimes when I speak to people, they are thrown off because of my tone or my vocabulary. Uh, and usually I have heard this regularly, e either growing up or even at my own church, um, uh, that I don't sound like a black man. And what is that tone when people say that, uh, what's, what's communicated is more of a bias than anything else, right? So because I don't sound or talk away than what you would assume that communicates that you have put me in a box or black people in a box, uh, mm -hmm. what they are supposed to supposed to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that what that shows you in and of yourself, if you're if you thought that or process that that bias has been, unfortunately, fueled by a form of racism. Right. And so, again, not many people often think along those lines because, again, they're like, well, I'm not I'm not racist. Well, that bias is, is you know, in the same way that uh, uh, speaking of race is uh, an implication of the gospel. Your bias, unfortunately, is an implication of racism that has kind of fueled our, our society. So, Man, so that's how I've, I've begun to think about it. And even how I've tried to disciple our people to begin thinking about it is like, man, like you may you may say you're not racist and that's fine. Praise God. Uh, but man, what are your bias? How how have you interacted with people that don't look like you taking a step further uh, socioeconomic status? The same as yours. Um, how uh, you vote. Right. Like all these different things are, are kind of fueled by by a bias. And so that's how, like I said, I've thought about it. Um, and like I said, even in our, even in our church. That's and a I, good word right there, Derek. And Chris, that just made me think about like, you know, until we have conversation, until we listen, until we dialogue about certain things, I think there's so many things that we don't know. And uh, it mm -hmm. made me think of this when you were talking, I sat down with some of our staff members that were black the other day before I preached on this. And I just said, Hey, this is what I'm preaching on. Now the floor is open. What comes to mind? What, what uh, mm -hmm. maybe do you want to speak into on this? What would you like to see? And I said, I'm just here to listen today. And, and mm -hmm. some of them shared with me that there had been moments where someone had said something um, that they had taken offense to, and they acknowledged, hey, that person probably didn't mean anything by it. Um, right. But then they also said, we didn't really want to say anything because we didn't want to be the person that mm -hmm. cried wolf and uh, said it was racist and things like that. And I, I boil mm -hmm. a lot of that down to us not having conversations, us being ignorant on certain things and us knowing how yeah. things come across. What, what are your thoughts on that? Man, so I'd, I'd 100 percent agree with you. I think I think for us as leaders and this is this is when leadership gets tricky. Right. We have to set the tone on creating, you know, for lack of a better term, the environment, if you will, where conversations like that are happening, where it's fostered, right? So, you know, something that we have said from the very beginning at Proclamation Church is, hey, we want to be a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational church, right? Mm -hmm. We have said that from the beginning. So for in order for us to be able to be those things, guess what? We have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There are going to be things that may not sit well in your, you know, your status or your preference that may sit comfortable with mine and on vice versa, there are going to be moments when it doesn't sit comfortable with mine, but it sits perfect for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And understanding that there are going to be moments where we're going to have to like have those conversations. Right. So when yeah. something has been said, you know, by a majority culture to a minority, Right. That that majority culture individual did not see it as a bad thing, but it was triggering for that minority staff person or minority member. And it's like, hey, 
I'm going to assume the best about you mm-hmm. because you're my brother, you're my sister in Christ. Uh, but in assuming the best here, as we have this dialogue and as I'm here, hey, I just want you to know that I may not have been bothered by what you said, but somebody else who may not have the rapport that you and I have may very well find this to be super offensive. You have to be mindful of, of what you say, right? You made me think too, like, you know, just before you leave is is this thought, like we can't do everything, but we can do something. You can't do. Man, that's, that's a good word. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And like I said, man, the Lord has placed us somewhere to be able to do something. Let's be faithful to what he's calling us to do. Let's not think that we can't do this, man. We have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Mm. We have brothers and sisters in Christ right. that we can lock arms with this in, right? It's going to be messy, but it's a mess worth making um, because it's one less thing that we've got to see sanctified when we see Jesus face to face. Come on. Come on, Derek. You got me ready to run through a wall, man. Thanks. <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> thanks again for being here, man. Man, what a powerful conversation. I love that guy. Awesome guy. Great he's, conversation. He's doing such an incredible job pastoring that church and leading. So, so pray for Proclamation Church mm-hmm. and... Um, what the Lord's doing down there. Sunday, one of your points, we were talking about uh, the Good Samaritan was that we, like the Samaritan, should have compassion on others. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking Sunday, like, man, if you could go sit down with every life group or, you know, go to our youth ministry on Wednesday nights or sit down with every family in our church and just have a conversation about this, how would you encourage them to practically live out the compassion that we see? Yeah. You know, uh, scripture talks about quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Yeah. And I think we live in a culture in a world that does the opposite. Yeah. Um, you know, social media, you've got to respond instantly. Um, yeah. We like to get the sound bite or s- say something back real quick. And I think it's hard to have any kind of compassion if we're not willing to listen. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, we, we even listen to this now or Sunday and we say, how can we have compassion? Well, we hadn't taken enough time to actually sit down and listen to people and maybe listen to where they're coming from, what they're experiencing, what they're going through. Whether we agree or disagree, I can still listen and feel for them and then have a healthy conversation after that. And so I think I would love to see us be quick to listen. And uh, because if we wanna see any kind of change, if we wanna see any kind of healing, it's not gonna come from Sam shouting, Sam yelling. I think think people think that's how they're gonna change something. that how, how will anything really, how will anybody win in that moment? Yeah. Um, you might win an argument, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you're actually winning the war of reconciliation. That's good. Probably means that you're losing it, That's good. even if you got uh, applause from people. Mm-hmm. And you know this, like as pastors, we know sometimes like what we can say mm-hmm. that will get a rise out of people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can form an angry mob That's good. instead of a body of believers. Yeah that are uh, loving their enemies, Mm -hmm. that are serving everyone. Like that's the stuff about the Bible that we don't always uh, like to look at or talk about. But even if I I can't stand what someone's doing, I'm still called to love them. And I can't love them if I don't listen, if I don't stop, if I don't sit down. And so for us to have compassion, I think when you look at the life of Jesus, his life was all about compassion. Um, he, He wept. Uh, when Lazarus died, he yeah. looked over and had compassion when he saw uh, just his own people go in the opposite direction, knowing that they were missing the Messiah. You yeah. know, he sat with Zacchaeus. He sat with a woman at the well who had had five husbands and the man she's with now is not her husband. He um, hung out with tax collectors and sinners. He never approved of their behavior, but he loved the person and had compassion for the person. And I think for us, we have to ask the question, what is the most important thing that we want to see? We want to see the gospel take root in people's lives and bring change. And if we if we would ask the question before we do anything else, will this person hear the gospel I want them to hear in the way I say something, in the way I approach something, we might do a lot of things differently. And so I think that's what I would say is that we would be willing to stop, listen, love, and show compassion. So good, so good. Man, this uh, has been fun today. It's been a good time. It's been a good, been time. A good time. We, we talked got about these Duke. headphones on right now. We talked about Duke basketball. <laughs> listen, <laughs> yeah. listen, I'm still mad that Tennessee lost. I didn't even watch the national championship last <laughs> night. But hey, to all of you that 
that that tuned in today uh man thank you if, if you want to share this send it to other people yeah. we're going to be doing this over the next few weeks and uh, we're going to be having a great time and so thanks for just joining us in this conversation and uh feel free to send us anything uh at our email addresses if you have questions or or things that you're wrestling with uh we want this to be an ongoing conversation that's why it's called between sundays we don't want it to be we came to church we left it's over because that's not how we get anywhere we want it to keep going so we look forward to the next week hey let me just clarify Jump something there, you said you said mm-hmm. send if you have any questions send it to our email addresses yeah. if you have any complaints send that to t froman that's terry froman at tsclife.org i was going to say pastor tom at tsclife.org <laughs> yeah, tom. yeah pastor tom <laughs> i thought he yeah. would love that yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right absolutely hey again thanks so much and uh, we'll see you guys next week see you guys